Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Azan Lawal is my name. I'm a, a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. I'm also a partner with Deloitte Nigeria. I'm in the audits and advisory space, and um, I'll be the moderator for today's um, ICANN webinar. Um, it's my honor to welcome you to this um, webinar um, for our great institutes, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. Um, as you are aware, the theme for, for this um, uh, webinar is leveraging technology to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on businesses. Um, you agree with me that there can be a better time to discuss a topic like this uh, because of the relevance of this topic to uh, what we are currently experiencing in the, in, in the world. Um, and I think um, as colleagues and um, uh, fellow uh, members of the Institute, I would like to um, uh, check with you all that we are all uh, keeping safe and um, um, ensuring that um, we keep to all the guidelines uh, by the health authorities on keeping safe in this uh, period of um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so back to the uh, topic of the day. Um, this topic will be discussed will be uh, for in the next one, uh, one hour and 30 minutes. Um, the Institute has assembled competent um, uh, panelists to do justice to this topic. Um, for the first 20 minutes, we'll have Mr. Olawale Noiki, who will be taking us through leveraging technology to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on businesses. Um, after that, for another 20 minutes, we'll have uh, Mr. Benedict Uzoma, who will be taking us through impact of technology innovation. Um, after that, for another 20 minutes, Mr. Greg uh, Uguchuku will be taking us through digital technology response. Um, so after these uh, presentations, we will have uh, another 20 minutes for question and answer. I will appeal that um, as the presentation is ongoing, if you want to type your question, feel free to do that. Um, I will take note of all the questions. And um, uh, when we get to the Q&A session, we'll take all those questions together. And feel free to direct your question to any of the panelists um, so that we can take note of that. Again, you are welcome to this um, edition of um, ICANN webinar series. Um, so I think uh, we can go to the first um, presentation. Um, just a brief introduction of Mr. Olawali uh, Noiki. Mr. Olawali is, the, is an Associate Director, Technology Advisory Services, KPMG Nigeria. And he has um, he's experienced in a number of um, so he has over 15 years experience delivering digital and technology enabled uh, business transformation and performance improvement services. Um, he leads the technology enablement team in KPMG Nigeria and has responsibility for developing technology enabled to do his presentation. Um, sorry, Mr. Olawale, can you check your audio?
Hello, Mr. Olawale. I need to check your uh, microphone. We can't hear you. Um, sorry, we can't we can't hear you. Can you check your microphone? Um, apologies, um, teams. Please, uh, we will um, try to resolve that very quickly. Um, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, why we try to resolve the uh, audio um, issues on the on Mr. Lawley's side. Uh, in the interest of time, I will quickly move to the um, second speaker. Um, and we'll probably come back to Mr. Lawley Naiki after, after that. Um, the second, uh, ben, Mr. Ben will be taking us through the Second presentation, the impact of um, technology innovation. Uh, Mr. Ben is the MD CEO of New Capital. Is the MD CEO um, um, of New Capital Cooperative Multipurpose Society. And he will be taking us through uh, the next presentation. He has over 25 years experience in consulting, manufacturing, banking, and um, with core competence in technology, strategy, and management, uh, electronic banking. Um, he has a number of qualifications and um, practical experience, and we'll be, le we'll be leveraging on that on this uh, presentation. So Mr. Ben, over to you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Let me quickly share my video. Okay, so I'm going to start my presentation by, by saying and uh, by sharing a good news and a not so good news. The good news is that the COVID-19 will end. Praise the Lord. And the bad news or the not so good news is that we don't know when it's going to end. Most of us will say, well, probably to end in three months. Some will say to end in six months. Some will end in 12 months. Some people are even predicting that this COVID-19 lockup and lockdown will probably last up to year 2023. And my own thoughts, and based on a few feedback from medical analysts, I think this we're going to be experiencing lockup and lockdown for some time until an effective vaccine is found. You know, when the vaccine is found, then it will be available to rich nations like America, Europe, and going to buy up everything first. Then the African leaders will begin to buy, and then when they get it, they keep for themselves. You know, the rich men will keep for themselves and for their families before now begins to get up, become available to the big hospitals until it becomes COVID becomes like a malaria fever, food and cata. The implication of this for everybody is that we need to begin to think along this line that this delay in resolution of COVID-19 will make innovation a necessity. We don't have a choice. What we're seeing today is going to continue for some time. Some disruptors have already been disrupted and some who have, been, who have not been disrupted will soon be disrupted. I mean, organizations like Airbnb, They've been dis they were disrupted for they've been disrupted by COVID-19. Uber, airlines, and all of that. We're seeing some new disruptors in Nigeria, very small new disruptors. You know, look at before people who are just tellers and now are now creative fashion people. We're no longer seeing face masks to be just for 
protection. Very soon, face mark will be for innovation, will be for class. You know, what's the class? What's the, the, the look of your face mark will determine the class you belong to. We're going to see very soon how sanitizers moving from just being clean liquids to perfumed cleansers. We're going to see, you know, air purifiers becoming disinfectants. It's, it's about innovation, you know. We have experienced, uh, I'm sure everybody in this house will agree with me, we have experienced sudden new needs. And there's going to be sudden new needs again. And this new needs will lead to a demand for innovation. And let us remember, innovation is about new things. It's about better things, about improved things, about new ways of doing things and new opportunities. So we need to begin to see that happening. Let's look at a few things that have happened so far. You agree with me now for sports, football, and all of that. We are now, we, our love for sports have not changed, but everybody's seen the need to watch his sports, his games, with social distance in mind. So all of this education, it is clear to every one of us that for a long time schools are Nigeria is that the gaps in learning will widen because there are people that cannot afford that cannot afford the smartphones. So there will be sudden need. Was gathering together to write I can exams will not work again. So there is a need for people to write I can exams from home to envisage what the guy is doing to ensure that it's not manipulating anything. You know, stock exchange, remote trading will be needed for us in an accounting profession. Can post transactions remotely now. So you, you will not be needed to come to your office to start posting anything. Everybody can, you, you, you can do inventory counting remotely, even with drones now. So the issue of analyzing past events, no work for accountants. We need to leverage financial data to create more insights into clients' business. You know, a, a few things that the Indians have done that we need to even look at, even as we speak now, Indians have developed robots that dispense sanitizers can entrance offices and gateways. They have robots now that are in isolation wards, dispensing food and freeing the medical people. There are, they, they, they have low cost, easy to use portable ventilators that's very cheap. They develop chemical formulation to public. So they don't need um, things like our last month to do that. So the, 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 the implication of this it's on technology. Now let's look at before now, before COVID-19, there are some technologies that everybody say, hey, these technologies will change the world. Now this is, that's what I have in this slide. What's the, the, the expectation before COVID-19 and COVID-19 reality? These two technologies on the left, your your cloud. Okay. Um, Okay, hope you see it now. Um, it's fine now. So everybody was talking about cloud, cloud before now, but really with, with COVID-19, cloud, online events have become more attractive. Artificial intelligence have become more attractive. So there is a sudden need for robotics. So even Nigerians are thinking about robotics in five years to come, with COVID-19, it's no longer the reality. We have to have robotics in the next one year. There is a sudden need for drones. 5G, because some smart guys have really 
pushed on the issue of 5G being um, something that will lead to the end of the world and the 66, there's this initial slowdown, but eventually people realize that 5G is all we needed. So there'll be a rise in 5G. Quantum computing that people are talking about but now will probably not be needed now, you know. Proto, remote pro right right now bring google that people say will be needed you know will not be needed but cryptocurrency yes in fact just this morning um facebook has asked somebody to be the so we know it is dying and that's true so businesses we need innovation businesses we need to optimize costs there'll be need to identify new sources of revenue for businesses need to identify customer needs from hidden data patterns, need to launch new products faster, need to engage minds that will reduce costs and need to use artificial intelligence because supply chain will be slow. All of these needs will make business we say, who will help us? Who will help us? Now, I, I think there are quite a number of professions that will take advantage of these opportunities because really technology is the answer. It will bring innovative ideas. IT developers are rising up to the challenge. I think the opportunity will be open for everybody. Accountants, there'll be opportunity, theater. I think new professional bodies will spring up in a matter of innovation opportunity for accountants. For me, post COVID-19, we will see emerging professions waiting for, waiting for the people that will grab it. Therefore, accountants, we need to start doing different things differently. Different things differently. We need to encroach into the technology space because for now, technology space is no man's land. And we must identify our roles as accountants. For example, the data protection thing. The traditional owner of data, I've always said, is the accountant. For some reason, we lost it to the IT people. But we need to grab it back now. Nigeria has brought up the Nigerian data protection regulation. And they are saying every organization must have a data protection officer. Nida have identified five million companies in the Nigeria that must comply. And every data protection officer, that must be the accountant because it's more like an internal control person, an accountant who understands technology. So an account accountant must be innovative to grab these opportunities. Okay, there are a couple of other opportunities waiting for you know, ideas like blockchain and all of that, but that's not my focus. My focus is to say there are dead accounting jobs. There are jobs you are doing now that are dead. There are jobs we are doing now that will die in the very short time. COVID-19 will kill those jobs faster. Therefore, our business should be to now focus on the new roles and the new opportunities. Accountants must begin to not just think technology, we must speak technology. Not just speak technology, we must be seen as a technology partner. Accountants must begin, whether you are working for an internal organization, an external organization, we must begin to say, how do we create a new need? How do we solve new problems with technology? Accountants must begin to focus in that area. Please let us begin to think like an entrepreneur and not a bean counter. There are opportunities to create new platforms. As we speak now, I know a young group of young accountants who have built a platform that, that's called Aggregate. It's an accountant, uh, it's a platform that was conceived by young accountants, built and developed, and COVID-19 has made Aggregate in need. And they are doing business now. An online e-commerce platform for farming conceived, built by accountants. Accountants must continue in this space. We must not just focus on accounting software, we must think of other gaps. If you come up with a great idea, the, writing the program to solve the problem is not a problem because you can always pay any developer to solve that problem. All we just need is to take the interest, have the interest in technology. And like I said, really, accountants must begin to do new things differently. COVID-19 has provided an opportunity for us to think that way, to innovate that way, to create new businesses in the line of technology. And I think we should grab it immediately. Thank you very much. So Hassan, we can hear you. Check your microphone. 
Okay, sorry. Can you hear me now? You're good. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ben. I think uh, we have about, okay, so the questions are coming in. We have about 11 questions. Uh, I'll take note of those questions and we'll come back to that after the presentation, all the presentations. So these 11 questions will be noted for Mr. Ben. Thank you so much. Now we'll go to the next uh, presenter. Um, let's check if Mr. Olawale is ready now. Mr. Ben, you can stop sharing your screen, please. So, Mr. Ben, you can stop sharing your screen so Mr. Olawale Noiki can, can comment. Okay, so in the interest of time, we'll, we'll go to, uh, okay. Okay, I think, uh, well, that is still work in progress. That is still being resolved. So let's go to Mr. Greg, um, who will be our, our second presenter today. Um, he is the technical advisor, public accounts committee, House of Representatives, Nigeria Assembly in Abuja. Uh, he will be taking us through digital technology response. Um, Mr. Greg has a, a degree in industrial mathematics and has master's de master's degree in um, in system engineering and a diploma in law um, as well, and a doctorate degree from uh, North Central University in business and technology management. Um, he has over 25 years experience um, across industries, including banking, academia, oil and gas, the public sector, um, and all that. So he is, um, a consultant to numerous organizations and institutions, including the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria. And he will be taking us through uh, the next uh, presentation, again, digital technology response. Uh, Mr. Greg, over to you. Yeah, uh, uh, folks, I'd like to uh, commend ICANN on this initiative. I hope you can all see me and listen and hear my voice. Um, my hello, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very well. Thank you. So, like I started, I like to commend ICANN for this great initiative, and um, that's one of the innovations that has turned up. Uh, with COVID-19. So one of the takeaways, as I have to, I have to highlight that, highlight that. So once again, my name is Dr. Greg Ezilo, uh, FCA of course, and uh, I provide the support for the National Assembly, uh, specifically for the House of Representatives for the Town Committee. We have been trying to sort out a few issues in the technology area and as well as accountability and transparency. So my discussion on this uh, bit will be in three folds. Uh, COVID-19, digital response. And of course, we all know that it's a pandemic. Um, we have, some of us have been through the experience, some are still going through the experience, uh, whether it's true or false, um, it, some needs to be proved, uh, either empirically or otherwise. So uh, I'm gonna be talking from three perspectives, before pandemic, in pandemic, and post pandemic. That is to say, before the pandemic arrived, did you have any response strategy, any response plan, be it technology, be it any other mechanism that can help, help you handle it? Then when you are now in pandemic, when you are in the thick of it, more Thank especially- you to share your screen. Uh, okay.
my screen is options is uh, Can you see it? Um, Hello. Not, not yet. Not yet, sir. A bit of issues here. Can you look at the share screen, um, green box and arrow up? Click yeah, it. I, I can see that, but. Um, Say it again. I'm using a Mac. Yes, the share screen button. Have you seen it? Click it. I and uh, my Mac. I can't see that button right away. Um, what I have here is more of. Um, okay. Um, hold on. I, I think you can just uh, progress. Let's continue while we this this slide will be shared with everyone after the after the uh, webinar. Please, Mr. Greg, can you go ahead, please? Okay. So, like I said, I was saying I'm going to I'm going to discuss this in three perspectives: before pandemic, pre -pan in pandemic, and post pandemic. And uh, in post pandemic, in pre pandemic, before I go on to this, I would like to uh, have a word of caution here. Uh, COVID 19 is real and um, is something, is a catastrophe that you can't wish for your enemies, let alone yourself. And um, uh, listening to a real victim or real victims we simply elicit some tear drops from your eyes. I would like to quote from a brother and a physician of 25 years experience who was in, in the, a victim in the US and uh, who only started his physical rehabilitation yesterday with minimum of working. And he said to me, COVID-19 destroys your lungs along with other parts of you if it can put you in a body bag. I repeat. COVID-19 destroys your lungs along with other parts of you if it can put you in a body bag. So that leaves you wondering what it does to your businesses if one has already gone in a body bag, God forbid. Now, in pre-pandemic, this suggests the following, that you have response strategy prior to its occurrence, your exposures to your businesses and environments are covered. Business resumption plan is in place. Identify pathways and tools for restoration of your business and everything is also in place. Now, if you have all those in place and you're already in pandemic, meaning you have been caught in it, prepared or not, as the whole world, of, uh, the whole world is today facing, Nobody, not even one single nation in this whole wide world can boast of a pre-pandemic response plan. And that's why we have the whole of catastrophe having the place. So what do you do here when you don't have a plan or if you have a plan? If you have a plan, this is the time to activate your initial emergency response if you have one. And this could include evacuation of key resources to recovery centers, or locations where you could work from conveniently, such as home offices, guest houses, Hello. or other places that you have uh, yeah. identified. Hello? Are you there? Please go on. Are you there? Yeah, yeah. please go on. So you expect everyone is safe at home and or, or at home offices, and you can access the usual tech facilities you have in place. Your phones, your laptops are in good working conditions, as you may not be able to reach support for equipment failures. You have your backup equipment facilities in place as well. And then information sharing and collaboration are key in pandemic. You have to see quite a enormous number of information, even information overload. So, but you have to sift through them 
and see what, which, what is applicable and what is not applicable and why, how you can share them. Ensure you have identified your knowledge gaps as expected and then be able to fill them while in pandemic. Engage with tech providers for applicable, for applicable technology solutions in your peculiar line of business. Make your critical applications to the, to the clouds if not already there. Visualize all, all the visualizables. That is to say, if you have five laptops or five systems or six or 10 systems that you could have been working with while you're in the office, but you are now working from your home, you can visualize nine, eight, 10 systems in one system that makes use of different applications. And you are having the whole of your office, the whole of your office network in one system as visualized. Of course, don't forget, like Ben has mentioned, make AIs your partner in pandemic. AIs are digital agents, they're digital assistants, they're digital professionals, they're digital support you can rely on while you are in pandemic. You no longer need to move because you are completely isolated. So these are your digital supports that you can make use of. There are so many of them there that you can, you, can, you can make use of. Machine learning and deep learning apps are all over the place. Some people do not or did not have the uh, need to visit their banks or visit anybody. They can stay and stay in their homes to reach out to all destinations, including making purchases overseas. I know I have done a lot of transactions overseas. The only thing that is crippling them now is international travels that could make them arrive in their destinations. So AIs are your great partner in pandemic. All of this I get was minimizing the initial grave impact of the pandemic on yourself and on your business. Then if you take all these steps, then of course you are sure to move on to the next level, which is post-pandemic or post-COVID-19. Now here, let me make this, ass this assertion. Technology is everything, and everything is technology. We are technology, and technology is in all of us. So it's only necessary for us individually or collectively to recognize the technology in us and then use it to live a stress-free life. It's as simple and as straightforward as that. You see, uh, like Ben said also, innovation is the key in pandemics. I, I remember 10 to 15 years back in one of my presentations at ICANN MCP, I did say and hide that accountants who have not IT democratized, who have not leveraged opportunities in IT, looking away to 10 to 15 years as of that time in 1999, will be left behind. And today, the realities of the day are that some of our accountants who are not technology enabled will be scrambling for support, for assistance of one kind or the other during the pandemic. Now, in post-pandemic, what to do? This is the restoration time. As we are now unlocking down the processes, the businesses, the offices, this is time to begin your restoration and begin to look at what to do. First, have you conducted initial final cleanup of your offices? Have you decontaminated all that was decontaminated? Then you begin to move back your resources to its original state. It is time to leverage on your inventions. Inventions that you have stumbled upon in pandemic. Inventions have come your way in pandemic. This includes new technologies, new methods of work, web facilities researched, Innovate in your own little way to work networks. Doubt. We have cultivated a new network in pandemic and in post pandemic. These are the things that come really handy for us to use and apply to our, to our businesses. And of course, 
I need to highlight some takeaways in this presentation. One, did you have an existing pandemic response strategy, Abby Initial? Yes. Um, as we know, the probability of a disaster lies between zero and one. But the probability of what sort of disaster you're going to have or the magnitude of that disaster, you cannot predict. The world as a whole knew about pandemics. They knew about it, but they never predicted that pandemic will come back today, this year. And the world also know that after this, there's going to be other similar occurrences. So as well in, South, in, the, in the West Coast, in the US, this pandemic is on, but yet another disaster is on its way. For example, this is the period of hurricanes. Some hurricanes start as typhoons, tornadoes, and by the time it gains 250 kilometers per hour, every structure, every facility in its way will be swept off. So because this is a yearly occurrence in the United States and elsewhere, they have prepared strategies to contain it. But in the case of pandemics, which you can't predict precisely when it's going to come, response strategies have been found to be lacking all over the world. And that is why you now have emergency responses coming by way of those in uh, hospital facilities, hotel facilities converting to hospitals, those in equipment maternity converting to uh, 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 producing uh, 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 pandemic uh, facilities such as uh, uh, ICUs and uh, face masks and all of that. And those in uh, electronic media converting to publicity and all of that. So how effective was your plan if you have any? If you had any, how was it activated? What are your losses in pandemic? Any fatalities? Unfortunately, there, except my sympathies. Do a checklist of all you did that added value to your business in pandemic, especially those technology apps, equipment, facilities, networks that have enabled you to scale through in pandemic to post pandemic. Checklist all your new apps and technologies that came your way in pandemic and make them work for you going forward. Have you added value to your business and yourself in pandemic? And then post pandemic, this will be your learning points going forward. Post pandemic is a time to cruise with your new ideas, new technologies, innovations, disruptions, and even float above the industry giants. And that is what we call disruptive innovation. Necessity is the mother of invention, they say. Today, COVID-19 has thrown us into such innovative formulations that we don't know can be our selling points. We don't know that can leverage our business beyond that height that we least expected. Innovation is the key. Disruptive, disruptive technologies are enablers post pandemic. There are so many of them in FinTech, in uh, AIs, in artificial intelligence devices, in um, uh, neural networks applications, Ben mentioned one. Uh, um, uh, some of the functions and use use it to do um, uh, the food is great. You are able to do the Checklisting all your apps and technology, have your added value to the business, and then post pandemic is time for, for like to prove that there are new technologies, innovations, and disruption. The future will become great 
you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Yes, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hassan. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Can you all hear me? So thank you so much, um, um, Mr. Greg, and I think that's a very um, uh, insightful You have to unmute yourself, Mr. Hassan. I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? I can hear you, Hassan. Okay, good. That's yes. Good. Sound speaking. All right. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Greg. I think we'll move to the last uh, uh, presentation now. I think um, I want to believe Mr. Olawale. Your can... audio is failing. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes, Mr. Olawale, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Fantastic. So I will go right into. I will go right into it. Uh, Mr. Greg, you would need to stop sharing. Thank you very much. Okay. So can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can. Great. So yes, uh, over the next ahead, Thank you. Uh, over the next couple of minutes, I will just take uh, a little time to take us through our view on technology and how it can be used to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on businesses. Uh, Quite a bit of it will also be sharing some of the experience we've seen with other players, other organizations, uh, and how they've coped through this. And hopefully that then just spurs some thinking for each and every one of us. Yeah. I think in terms of what we'll try to get out of it, it's really to discuss the impact itself. Very quickly look at how technology can be used. Uh, and you will see me utilize the word digital as opposed to technology intermittently and then obviously just to share views on some of the practical lessons as we begin to think about using technology to mitigate the risk of the pandemic on our businesses both today and going into going into the future now if we just sit and think about where we find ourselves today we are currently facing what is a global uh, pandemic nearing 4 million confirmed cases, over 200,000 deaths right across the globe, and significant impact right across businesses. Now, what we've then noted is that right across a number of countries, a number of businesses, there has been significant impact. There have been various uh, strategies put in place to, in a sense, flatten the curve, mitigate the challenge of COVID-19 in itself, which has resulted in closure of national borders, local borders, restrictions on movement, stay at home, which is why a number of us today on this webinar are in our various homes, joining in and leveraging technology. But what we see, right, is that a number of those containment measures and management strategies that have been adopted right across the board have significant impact on business, and what we previously knew to be uh, our way of life and way of doing things. So what we see is that customer engagement is significantly impacted. For a number of organizations who relied largely on foot traffic to execute their business or physical visits to uh, customer locations to sort of push their services and their products, you've seen that has been completely disrupted if you're not an essential service because essentially you cannot move around. And as a result of that, obviously, how then do I market my, how do I market my product? If I require foot traffic to drive business, but there's no foot traffic because everyone is locked at home, obviously there's, there's no business for me. So I'm unable to engage my customers as a result of what's going on. From a supply chain perspective, I can't, I can't receive inputs for my business if I'm in manufacturing business. I also can't move products as well 
because obviously because of the restrictions, I can't exactly have trucks, I can't have cars, I can't have bikes if it's the road moving products around, especially where those lockdowns and those restrictions are absolute uh, in nature. What you've also then seen, which is also a concern to a number of us in the room as accountants, is even in terms of business operations, a number of operations from a business perspective are significantly impacted. Because what you, what you notice is that your brick and mortar operations have, in a sense, ground to a complete and utter halt because shops are closed, business premises are closed, and activities are then being done from whatever other locations where they are possible. A significant component of that is for businesses that relied largely on cash. Where, where, do, you, where do you now receive that cash? And where do, you, where do you take the cash to, even if you are able to receive it, because you are unable to take it to, to a bank? And then last but not least, in that space as well, is as accountant, how do I then begin to deal with keeping my books, closing my books, providing operational management and other types of reports for running my business? And then last but not the least, obviously, if you go back to the fact that I can no longer engage my customers the way I used to engage them, and my supply chain and operations are also impacted, is that even the business models for a number of organizations have completely been upended by the COVID-19 pandemic and just the impact it has had on the way uh, work is being done by various businesses and by various individuals. Bottom line of all of this is obviously there's a financial impact because if I'm unable to do business, obviously I cannot generate revenue. And obviously there's nothing for me to account for at the end of the day to a large, to a large extent. But the beauty of this is that technology, as we have all seen across a number of uh, spheres, is aiding the ability to overcome a number of these challenges in very, very interesting ways. Uh, as, 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 as near as three months ago, how many would have thought you would have a webinar of this nature with the total number of participants, as at my last check, there are over a thousand uh, participants on this webinar. Typically, what would have happened is something like this would have been done physically. But the beauty of it also is that, in all honesty, none of what we're seeing is entirely new. The reality of it is that digital and the use of technology is the new normal. And all that COVID-19 has brought about is accelerating the adoption and acceptance of that reality. Because what you find is, if I just think about what has happened to a number of businesses where people now work from home or execute their transactions from various portals and the likes, the only reason why that has been possible is that over the last couple of years, because the statistics that are on the current slide are actually a bit dated. These are from a survey done by KPMG in 2016, where a number of CEOs, a number of C-suite executives had already begun to think about digital as the new way of doing things, and had already begun to push the frontiers of leveraging technology to drive their businesses. So what you, you find is that as a result of COVID-19, you simply accelerated the need to do that. So what a number of people thought, I can wait two years, three years to do, it had to crash those programs and execute them literally overnight. And that is the new normal. Because what you will find is work from home, what it did create for a number of businesses. Instantly, people had to begin to think about how do I conduct my meetings, which would typically have happened physically, how do I begin to conduct them while people are sitting in their homes? In saying people should work from home, people immediately have to begin to think about how do I ensure there's the capacity for the people to work at home and they have the equipment to work from home. Right. Beyond what is then happening is, beyond what is then happening is, you find that the actual demographics of the customer base in Nigeria and across a number of countries further aids the conversation around leveraging technology because you have a significant uh, young population who's very tech savvy, very used to doing things on their mobile devices, very internet savvy and literally want to have pleasant experiences in executing everything. So you begin to see people say to their banks, you know what, I can execute a transaction with Amazon on a portal. Why do I need to walk into a bank branch 
to execute my transaction? Why can't I go onto a portal? Why can't I do it from my mobile device? Because that is the new normal. That is what they are beginning to grow up with. But I will come back to a point on this slide in a few, in a few slides down the line, because if you just take a look at the numbers for a country that has bordering on 200 million population, if you go by uh, the various uh, discussions out there, if I have 95 million potential internet users, it means I potentially still have a significantly large chunk of individuals within the country that potentially aren't internet users or aren't uh, active in the use of the internet. So that is something to please note as, as, as we continue to talk about the leveraging of technology. Now, having said that, what really is this leveraging of technology and digital? Really what it is at the end of the day is the utilization of emerging technologies, right? And using that to build new capabilities and refine the way we do business. From a business model perspective, from an operating model perspective, and from a financial perspective as well. And the slew of emerging technologies that aid those conversations, there's a myriad of them. There's robotics where I can begin to replace the things that individuals do with the use of bots and well-designed programs that in a sense mimic what a human being would have had to do with those with 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 with, with, with the code that's been that's been put in. There's leveraging cloud. So I no longer have to think about having every single piece of physical infrastructure put into my own business and run by my own IT team. I can leverage cloud infrastructure to be able to scale very quickly and to be able to very quickly use the same technology across a wider outreach and scale my business a lot quicker. There's digital payments, which in a sense is what a lot of us are, uh, are quite used to now, where I no longer have to transact using cash. I can pay off of a portal, I can leverage digital channels, I can you know, POS, ETC, ETC, ETC. Now, all of this is coming together in a sense to create the perfect storm for the leveraging of technology to drive our business as we go forward. Now, where then do we see technology or digital addressing the various challenges businesses are, are faced with as we begin to think about uh, the impact of COVID and how we come out of it better, stronger, and uh, more nimble businesses? And I, I really would speak about that from largely four major pillars. One is around the engagement of your customers. Technology can very quickly be used to cross the digital divide. So remember, I, like I mentioned earlier, one of the key impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic has had is people no longer can move around as of right now with all the lockdowns or semi-lockdowns semi as, as you may want to describe them. So it's difficult to engage customers and transact business. But you can leverage technology to cross that divide and a number of organizations are, are already doing that uh, if you if you just think about the significant increase in a lot of the digital marketing that's done on instagram that's done on twitter that's done on facebook and other such solutions over the last couple of weeks both in nigeria and globally you begin to notice that what has happened is people have immediately moved the engagement of customers from physical brick and mortar type activities to the use of technology and some of these technologies are not new. And some of these technologies are not even technologies that the businesses own themselves. They are actually platforms that are available and can be utilized if you have the right strategies in place and you determine that this is the new way my business must run and has to run. And therefore, what is out there for me to leverage? So immediately, you can engage your customers leveraging the available tools. Technology also allows you to empower your employees to actually work from home and work from whatever location. So what you find is that cloud technology is where I can put my uh, business applications, I can put my transactional applications, and the, uh, the availability of internet, ETC, allows people to execute their day-to-day -day transactions from their mobile phones or from their laptops or from whatever other devices are available to them to execute business and ensure that business continues to run smoothly, even though physical presence is either impacted or impossible to achieve. So you have situations now where I no longer have to walk into a physical building, 
to request for my financial uh, documents so that I can execute my financial reporting. Cloud solutions have enabled a lot of businesses to run their closed book transactions over the last two months, I dare say, from their homes with various individuals simply utilizing their laptops, iPads, mobile phones, and the likes to execute the relevant transactions that they need from their homes. Now, it also allows us to optimize our operations. So if you think about a very simplistic uh, example, I would like to procure certain items for my business to run or for my business to execute its day-to-day -day operations. And what would typically have happened pre-COVID for a number of organizations, especially where everything was either manual or semi-automated, is that someone would have to take a piece of paper with the request from table to table, requesting for someone to approve from one level to the next and then to the very next. But what you find is that technology and there are various types of technology that aid that, has allowed us to be able to transform processes like that to being things that can be done totally without the need for that physical interaction. So uh, the various business process management solutions out there, the various ERP solutions out there, aid us in the ability to transform our processes into online automated solutions that truly can be executed from various locations, taking away the potential impact of lockdowns. And we need to think about these things because ultimately, uh, like the first two speakers have said, yes, we have a semi-lockdown situation right now and a lot, of, a lot of people are pushing towards, you know what, let's completely open things up. But the reality of the COVID situation is that if you read, if you read the, the statistics out there, it isn't going anywhere in a little while. And it has changed what is our normal permanently. So you need to begin to think about how do I use that as a business to reshape the way we do things. And last but not least, obviously, is that it's also transforming products and services that various businesses are rendering. I mean, a simple example here, so, so, I, so I can very quickly go on, is the fact that prior to the COVID occurrence, a lot of us should just think about it. Who would have thought Eco Hotel would be offering food delivery and laundry services on Instagram and saying that, you know what, we can pick up your laundry in your house and deliver it back to you. Or we can deliver food to you. Simply call this number or go to this portal and make a request. So it's changing products, it's changing services and how they're executed. But we must also remember that in achieving all of that, there are a number of pillars that you need to focus on you need to ensure that it is not just about the technology. It's actually about what does my business require? Not everything is going to be done by you or your business. You are going to need to build ecosystems. So you are going to need to be able to leverage available technologies, available skills. Not everything needs to be done in-house. There needs to be strong executive sponsorship and leadership in whatever business, because you can put the best technologies in place if you don't have that executive sponsorship, obviously it will fall over on its face. And last but not least is that, obviously you must ensure the change and the innovation culture is engendered to ensure that there's that continual reinventing of the business and reinventing of how things are done leveraging technology. Yeah. Now, these really are just a few examples of what a number of organizations are doing. So in the consumer market space, your fast moving consumer goods, what you're finding is that a number of the entities there are bypassing the middlemen and are focusing more on the direct to customer type models and using e-commerce and online channels to both market their services and execute uh, relevant transactions such that they are able to continue to do business in the most effective manner. I mean, just think about what EKDC is also doing and literally was doing even before COVID-19 too. Took, it, took its impact out on all of us. You can buy your meter tokens online. Uh, if you have a postpaid meter, you can make those payments as well online. So which means I do not have to walk into a, an EKEDC or whatever other power company uh, cash office to make a payment to execute that transaction. That truly is the power of technology. Uh, if you look in the banking space, I mean, I don't think there's any bank that doesn't have an online portal, a mobile portal, and in, a, in addition to that, what they're also beginning to do is leverage things like bots to also push 
a number of the items that uh, people, human beings would typically have done, you're moving a lot of those things to more consistent channels, leveraging bots such that everything is done consistent and I'm able to use the power of technology to drive the way things are done in my business and get more value out of things. Now, obviously that creates its own challenges in the fact that you have to be careful in how you go about it, but it also then creates significant opportunities for being able to better utilize and leverage my human capital within the organization, right? But having said all of that, right, I must lay emphasis, and I mentioned this earlier on the fact that there literally is a tale of two Nigerians. So whilst we all may focus on the fact that yes, technology is the way to go, and yes, I must utilize technology in my business to drive activities and to overcome the COVID challenge, you must remember that there are two sides to the story. Remember I mentioned earlier that if we have roughly 95 million active internet users in the country, if my total population is 200 million, it means I have over half of that population as well that are not internet users. And those are your individuals that are less educated. Yes, they have mobile devices, but their utilization of digital channels and technology is somewhat limited to potentially use of USSD, so text type uh, activities. So as you think about the leveraging of technology and digital to drive business and overcome COVID, you have to remember that you cannot fully neglect that other half of your potential customer base that may not be as tech savvy and also needs to be catered to. So you don't lose that entire half. So in, in, in the execution of technology strategies and uh, leveraging technology, you have to balance both sides as, as you move forward. Now, I won't bore you with this slide. Uh, what this really just focuses on is the fact that there are various components to this technology conversation. There's a front end aspect of it, which is really what your end users or your customers see. And that is the layer that allows you to differentiate how you interact with the, the varied customer base. So people can use their computers off, off the internet, people can use USSD, can use mobile apps, uh, can use social media or whatever other channels they have to interact with your business. That's the front end, that's what the customers will see. There's the services layer of it, which is really what in a sense, integrates your back-end uh, solutions and infrastructure with the front-end that your customers see. Now, a lot of the services don't need to be owned by individual businesses. They actually are service providers that provide a lot of those facilities and can be leveraged. Data and analytics is also extremely important because as you begin to transform your business and leverage technology in a new way, what you must emphasize and focus on is then to be able to take the data and insights you drive and get from the use of technology to drive further change in your business. And the one area that a lot of people will be very conversant with is the backend infrastructure and legacy solutions, aka the ERP that a lot of people have. So what this picture is just intended to paint is the fact that the leveraging and utilization of technology is beyond just ERP solutions and putting in place servers. You need an entire ecosystem to deliver this. And this ecosystem does not need to be owned or delivered solely by your business alone. You will need partners and collaborations to deliver on this. Now, just as I run for, as I run for the close, I have said quite a number of things around some of the things that can be done to leverage technology, but you must also bear in mind that as you begin to think about the use of technology, there are key signposts that you must bear in mind. Collaboration I've spoken to, not everything needs to be done by you. Who are, who are, what technologies are out there are available that you can leverage? And how do you leverage them? Who do you need to collaborate with to, to gain entrance and access to those solutions? Cybersecurity is extremely key because as you use technology more, you must obviously bear that in mind. You must protect the data and you must build the capacity internally to truly utilize technology to its best because a lot of organizations fall over because they don't have the capacity to actually deliver some of the solutions that they have in mind, but are, uh, are unable to then go through the entire process. So if I was beginning to leave you with a few closing thoughts, where should you start as a business? And where should you start as finance professionals? First, you need to be able to sit back and look at your business and say, where are we? What do I have in place today? And what is it that I need to put in place? A lot of organizations prior to COVID hadn't put anything in place, and those, a number of those businesses have now taken complete form. So 
throughout this pandemic period and the lockdown. But for a lot of organizations that had a baseline, it was accelerating what they needed to do, which allowed them to stay in business in a sense and transform very quickly. You must be able to identify what parts of your business will be impacted by technology and how you can leverage technology. You must obviously create uh, a business impact and focus on the technology driving business and not technology. And uh, by, by, in a sense, you must focus on your business driving the use of technology and not technology in a sense driving business. It has to be about the business, not just about the technology. You must also bear in mind who you have in your business, what type of individuals you have in your business. And you must begin to think around what skills do I need to build, what uh, capacity do I need to build within the business to ensure that things can be done effectively with technology and I don't lose anyone in the process. And as we begin to transform the way certain things are done and certain jobs may vanish, we'll be honest about that, how do I repurpose these people and build new skills in them so that they can be used for other value-adding items within the business? And in closing, really, I'd say it's three major things for us as professionals. It's be informed, know what is out there, know what impacts your business, know what others in your sector, both globally and locally, are doing so that you're able to utilize technology and aid your business. Seek opportunities to adopt technology. Seek, seek, and seek yet again more and more opportunities for from digital and technology in your business. And obviously, make it more holistic. It's not just about the back end. We also have to think front end, how do I engage customers? How do I improve my supply chain? How do I improve production? How do I improve my reporting? And then obviously, transform your business. You need to transform to, in a sense, stay abreast, stay alive, and stay profitable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lawale. Um, and um, I think that's a very good and insightful presentation. Now, we will go into uh, the questions now. Um, we, we, had, we have about over 100 questions, uh, but I think we've been able to address about 62 of those questions. Uh, we have 56 questions. I think I've, um, some of the questions um, were actually directed to uh, some panelists, and I'll, I'll go through that. And some are actually generic questions, which, um, which I've taken note here. I think uh, there are so many questions around whether the materials and the videos will be shared. Um, so I can will share the link to the video and also the materials immediately after the uh, webinar. Um, so there are questions around the ICANN exams. Is, is uh, online uh, option is being considered? And um, some question directly to ICANN, which will take uh, send that to ICANN. Please expect feedback from from ICANN. We will try as much as possible to go through the remaining 57 questions. Um, if we are not able to get through everything, ICANN will uh, send uh, responses to some of these questions by email uh, to all the participants. So um, what I will do is I will take, um, I think the pan all the panelists um, um, can see the questions. We'll take uh, 10 questions uh, and then we'll answer that in about five minutes or so. Then we'll come back to take another quest set of uh, questions and hopefully we'll be able to go through um, all the questions. Um, I think the first question we have here Okay, Mr. Olawale. Yes, please. How do we cope or mitigate the attendant uh, vulnerabilities occasioned by increased increased re reliance on various uh, IT platforms during COVID-19? For instance, Zoom bombing and other vulnerabilities that allow attackers steal window login credentials, unauthorized uh, reproduction of e-signatures e and other sensitive uh, documentation, uh, document, document of organizations and all that. So I think there's another question on the risk, the challenges of technology that we currently have in the country. Are we going to survive post COVID? I mean, when we all embrace technology. I think you can take uh, that together. 
Okay. Um, then, what would be the negative impact of COVID-19 on our global economy? Going through loss of jobs, um, what can we advise the government to do in order to create and maintain more uh, job for youth? For youth? Um, I think if uh, Mr. Lally can take that as well. Okay, so can I go ahead? No, just hold on. I want to read 10 questions. Just take note, please. Okay. In the interest right. of time. Uh, yeah. So can you assist participants with a website on application that will enable us to gain insight into AIs? I think we are, have a lot of questions around AI. So I think it would be good to uh, spend about one or two minutes just talking about AI and how uh, accountants can leverage on that. So uh, Mr. Greg, will you take that, please? So there's also another question on how technology can assist a Greek sector, especially poultry farming, which is labor intensive. So I think this Okay, so there's also a request for advice for external auditors um, to leverage on technologies. Uh, what advice will you give uh, going for, for auditors going forward on effective audit in post-pandemic uh, in Nigeria? Because there are too many, uh, many of our companies are still uh, using manual and uh, paper, paper works, using paper works and all that. So uh, without an effective computerized system. Uh, Mr. Ben, would you like to take that? Uh, I can also jump in on that at some point. Um, okay, so I think this uh, question is implementation of technology, COVID-19, especially in accounting profession, is largely dependent on data. How does the various data protection regulations, data privacy, and sovereign data affect seamless implementation of the technology initiatives. Um, Mr. Greg, will you take that? Um, because it has to do with regulations and all that. Um, the post uh, pandemic points raised are my concerns. That's uh, Mr. Ben. If we all agreed that even the best of nations do not have response pre-COVID-19, and all predictions and submissions are failed, can we say being prepared for post-COVID is also not necessary, apart from the fact that we all need technology? Um, I hope we get the question. I think it's all about, um, we shouldn't lose hope. I think we need to continue to uh, remain positive. So there's another question on AI. I think that will be taken all, all together. So what are suggestions for accountants to develop competence to meet up with some application skills for function effectively and reclaim accountant rules taken over by IT personnel and AI? I think that's also AI question. And this is for ICANN. What is ICANN doing to overhaul the whole syllabus in accounting education existing across Nigeria tertiary institutions, especially the area of ICT? So many accounting students are ICT dumb. Um, they are not, they are unfit for the time and all that. So I think it's all about what ICANN is doing to, to um, I think we can take that, um, so someone asked for more hints on data protection. Okay. So I think let's let's take that question if in about five minutes, please. Uh, Mr. Ben, you want to go first? Okay. Um, the question I have here is about saying, do we? The post-pandemic arrest concern. Can we say? Can we say being prepared for post-COVID-19 is also not necessary? Apart from the fact that we all need technology, I I would beg to disagree with that last comment. I would say 
being prepared for post-COVID is very necessary because post-COVID has exposed a lot of weaknesses in the world. It has exposed a lot of weaknesses in Nigeria. It has exposed a lot of weaknesses in businesses. It has changed the needs of people. Everybody is realizing some things people did not think was necessary has become necessary. Some things people took for granted is no longer grant for, taken for granted. So every organization must prepare for post-COVID post because that, that's the new normal. We are not going to go back to how life was before um, um, COVID. So be, you must be prepared for post-COVID. Therefore, you must be in, innovative. You must begin to see the changing needs of people. You must begin to see the changing service needs and change your own service model, change your own business model. You no longer need to bring everybody together to get something done. So what are the things you need to do to get things done without bringing people together? That's, that's really what this is all about. So depending on your industry, there are new needs. Figure out what those new needs are. Figure out how do we solve those needs and, and you get there. I think that's the only question for me. Uh, can I? Uh, I, ask me, I want to also make a comment. I would love to make a comment on that um, Data Protection Act. Um, Need that the Nigerian Information Technology Development Agency has brought out a, an, a regulation, Nigerian Data Protection Regulation. And that regulation is backed by NIDA Act of 2007. That regulation says that every organization that keeps data of 1,000 people over a six month period must, uh, must submit an audit of their data protection processes. And they, they said, neither will sense organizations. The organizations are audit firms, legal firms, professional advisory service firms, and IT people, who will serve as data protection compliance organizations. Those people, their responsibility is to train, to consult, and to audit data protection compliance of organizations. The regulation also says that every organization must appoint a data protection officer whose job will be to ensure data privacy and protection is implemented in the organization. So what that means really from my own point of view is the original owner of data is the accountant. But over time, we began to move it, we, we left it, and the IT people took over. But we need to go back to that. We are the original owners of data. Neither say there are 5 million organizations in Nigeria that must comply. If you don't comply, if you don't comply, your revenue, they will charge you. If, you, if they don't comply, they will charge you 1% of your previous year's revenue if you keep more than, if you keep less than 10,000 people's data. If you keep more than 10,000, charge you 2% of your previous year's revenue. So it's a big issue and it's a big opportunity for accountants. We should take up that role. Accountants should be the data protection officer. There are 5 million job vacancies in Nigeria today. That's what I say. That's, that's why I say it. There are 5 million opportunities for every young accountant. We should play that role. So data protection is, and, and, and Kubernetes has exposed a lot of things about data protection, a lot. You know, security of people's information has become key. If you are working from home and somebody is connecting from home to the office to work on your data, what is the guarantee that that data is protected? The accountant should come and play that role. That is my submission. Is there any other one? Okay, so I'll I'll very quickly speak to uh, a few of the a few of the questions. I think the very first one is around the question on how to, how to, how to mitigate the impact of on board of vulnerabilities on our leveraging of technology and its reliance uh, going into the future. Uh, I think during during the presentation, I had mentioned the fact that cybersecurity is an important part of our leveraging of technology. It cannot be ignored and it cannot be wished away. 
there are significant vulnerabilities out there. And the only real way to deal with those is the same way you put technology in place, you have to also have strategies in place for dealing with uh, challenges. And it's, you need to be able to go back to what is my technology and what mitigants do I want to put in place to ensure I don't fall into the wrong hands, I don't end up uh, having all sorts of vulnerabilities in my organization. So you also need to put in place cybersecurity strategies that ensure things are ring fenced appropriately. So the, 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 the respondent had asked about things like Zoom bombing ETC. The reality of Zoom is, to a large extent, a lot of people that use Zoom, it's a free service. What a number of large corporates are doing is they're not using Zoom. They are leveraging other solutions and tools, e.g. Microsoft Teams, where I need to have a subscription and I can, in a sense, ring fence who have access to my meetings with Active Directory. So only people within my organization with certain credentials will be able to join the meeting because they have the right credentials. But Zoom open to anybody is it what you find is that you need to be able to say to yourself, what am I trying to achieve? What kind of information am I going to share on this platform? That is actually what we do. What technology is put in place? You must also really and really with your infrastructure and your parents to ensure the right firewall, the right protection is in place. So you also don't you also don't uh, fall into fall into challenges. Let's let's, let's put COVID aside for a second. Prior to COVID, there are no sort of ransomware as well across countries. Uh, uh, there are very few organizations that will tell you they haven't had ransomware uh, challenges to deal with. But the people have dealt with those things, and how have they dealt with them? It's putting the right strategy in place. It's putting the right mitigants in place. It's the same way you put a security guard in front of your physical okay. building. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Guard yourself. You need you need to be able to also determine yes. what type of security infrastructure frameworks and processes I must put in place to protect myself. And that also then leads to what solutions I need to have. That that that's, that's on the one hand, right? Uh, there was a question around the technology challenges in country in the country and how how does that impact the leveraging of of, uh, of digital and technology across the board. I'll also go back to my presentation where I mentioned that in a sense you have two Nigerias. You have the Nigeria with people that are tech savvy, use the internet, use their mobile devices, have computers and the likes. But you also have the Nigeria where, yes, they have mobile phones, but all they're interested in is text messages and USSD type solutions. So you have to be able to take that in mind as you begin to say, what I the target audience you have will determine what type of solution. So, in a sense, use that to piggyback on the man that said, How do I utilize technology to support the agri sector? I remember a few years ago, what the uh, can do when trying to reach out to the farmers, it wasn't a fancy application, it was the USSD based text message service respond to X number with X, Y, and Z details so we can get your name into a database and we can provide you with fertilizer or with funding etc. So it's guiding your target audience and what you're trying to achieve as a business to determine what technology will I put in place and how will I leverage those technologies. We cannot put aside the fact that Nigeria has technology challenges. So it isn't all hunky dory. We have to bear in mind our current context and the reality of our nation in determining what technologies we utilize. What that also then does is that you may then need to have certain, in a sense, backup solutions or frameworks that may not be necessary in the developed world. So for instance, what we've seen in a number of uh, entities, even in Nigeria, is that whilst I have an online solution that allows people to make orders, so if, if you're in the consumer markets or fast moving consumer goods space, so you might have an online solution where people can go in and say, I want to buy X, I want to buy Y, make payments and the like. But on the back end of that, I would also then have a dedicated mobile number. We have challenges on my online phone. We call this number to make your order. 
it connects and bring more that allows your business to run and leverage technology because there's a myriad of them out there and you have to be able to then determine what works best for you then in mind what you are trying to achieve and the context of the mission as, as a whole. Uh, I think there's also a question around uh, how does it impact on us? Uh, what boils down to is that there's a benefit and very important thing. What is our role in the business? We're not doing that. We cannot support the company anymore. We have a charge on how do you leverage technology, utilize that to drive business value. And how does that happen? How do I ensure that my financials are done in the right manner? How do I ensure that the business strategy aligns with what is best practice or leading practice? How does that align to what will drive profitability for my business? And how do I use technology to support all of that? So as accountants, we cannot just be thinking uh, when people submit to the close or look. I have to think about how do I truly support strategic initiatives aimed at adding value for the business and drive that. That also leads to the need to build new skills. So it will remove just knowing about our company standards and IFRS to knowing about what solutions are out there and how do they impact my profession? And how am I able to utilize that knowledge to drive business value? It would be to not just understanding debit and credit, but understanding to some extent, and you don't have to become a data scientist, but understanding data science such that I'm able to take all of the insights and information that comes out of all of this technology to create insights for my business. So my my, my uh, management reports go beyond just showing the numbers to say we made X profit or X loss to say to the business, yes, we made X profit, but based on the underlying data available, this is why that profit happened. And these are some of the things we may need to do going into the future to continue to drive such growth. Or these are some of the things we need to do to mitigate some of the losses we may have experienced in the, the, the immediate preceding uh, period. So, there's also a lot of learning just outside of just the financials that this will also then drive. And we must clearly bear in mind and put front and center in our thinking. Uh, in terms of AI, I, I, I think that's, that's what I'm saying. Mean, I think what I, I, what I would just say. AI in one minute so that uh, we can. So I will, I will. I think what I, what I would just say around that is whilst AI is a beautiful thing to think about and it is fantastic, right? you also have to bear in mind, remember what we said earlier, there are two Nigerias. So AI is beautiful, it will support a lot of things, but is it the best fit for Nigeria today? Is it the best fit for your business and what you're trying to achieve? That question, only you can answer as you think about your strategy and your own business. And resources are myriad. I mean, we can share those, we can share uh, available resources and AI tools that you can look into, but ultimately what you pick has to be driven by what the business requires and not just about the technology. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. So, Mr. Greg, please, let's, um, sorry, maybe in two, three minutes so that we can... Um... Okay, uh, thank you, um, co-panelists and uh, listeners. Um, I have uh, one particular question here from Dr. Tapo from Akure, who wants to find out how the industry can prevail on Nigerian leaders to reduce telecom costs since telecom will be a major in COVID coping strategy, of course, also post-COVID COVID, COVID, uh, strategy uh, response, I must say. Now, um, you will agree with me the bulk of the challenges that uh, front-end users of telecom services talk about the banks, insurance, uh, institutions of higher learning, uh, government agencies, and all of that, rely on the back end, that is the service provided by the telecoms operators. And of course, the telecoms operators have a huge challenge infrastructure-wise in this country. Do you have electricity 24 hours? Do you have support technicians? Do you have other uh, enablers that will make telecoms flow smoothly? 
and be on a cruise style? The answer is no. You'll agree with me that most of the telecom providers use their own power sources to keep their base stations running 24 hours, 24 seven. And this is a huge cost. However, that does not detract from the fact that something can be done to reduce costs. Even within the, the, the telecom sector, they are also working. They are, they are mindful of the fact that the consumers are paying huge costs to be able to use their services. The consumers are not just the, the, the secondary consumers like us who use their airtime air and all of that. The primary consumers are those who provide front-end services, the, the bank that must have their ATM running, the agents that must ride on ERP uh, systems to be able to reach out to their, to their uh, other end users. The federal service today rides on what we call GFMIS, which is a central network that enables all connected agencies and even private sector organizations that must be able to interact with the government environment. So, but most of the time, these services degrade. They degrade substantially. You could see what happened at the beginning of this, uh, of this presentation. So one of the panelists had issue with, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, voice and all of that. These are tech issues that perhaps if you drill it down, it wasn't his own making. It could have been, uh, a technology issue that is related to that. Now, NCC, who is the only regulator in this industry, is also doing some jobs to ensure that the end users, the customers, do not pay through their nose to make use of these services. But uh, they're also doing that. They're also doing that in, in and also balancing the cost benefits uh, cost benefit line there. That those providing the services also have to. Uh, uh, as a business, have a bottom line at the point where it should, it should, it should be. So uh, government do, does the needful through awareness, through uh, some other uh, measures they could take, including regulation and, um, and, um, and uh, laws as well. Power is a major issue in the country. Just the way Nigerian government was able to solve the telecoms crisis of the past. If you remember when we had Nitel as a monopolist in this country, everybody goes to Nitel office and queue up and then uh, stay there as, as long as you can. So 60% spent in keen to make telephone call, 40% for other services you need to render. You need to render. But today that's, that's gone. That's, that's, that has been solved completely. But then we have another one, the crisis of energy. Today, more than 60% of every Nigerian make their own energy. You either go through uh, generators, series of generators, or go through some other alternatives like solar systems, inverters, and all of that, just for you to have what basically you should have in a functional society. So if you are running a business and you are paying heavily to sustain these energy facilities you have, then of course you will agree that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, cost of doing business would have also gone high. Now um, let me also quickly respond to um, uh, the agri question and uh, how uh, um, um, consultants and accountants can deploy uh, AIs in their businesses. Yes, it's quite simple, but then it also comes with its own costs. And of course, of course, you cannot run AI facilities or solutions without also a dependency, like dependency on energy. And where you don't have energy, the AI you have in your place as a robot will just be an ordinary decor, a kind of piece of furniture that cannot function without the enabler enabling energy to run it. Okay, now what is the difference between the agricultural setting here and overseas? Where you go to a large expanse of farm that can take the entire of uh, Ikorodu as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a town, but you will not find more than two or three physical human beings there. All you find is, is, is enablers, energy enablers, uh, work enablers, and uh, uh, agents, digital agents in the environment. But do we have the capability? Do we have the capacity? Do we have the financial wherewithal to be able to implement that here? Now, perhaps for smaller businesses, of course, that can be able to afford 
some level of automation using the 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 multimedia i mean the 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 social media platforms then using uh, small uh, drones robots that can help them do a few things on site uh, for example doing an inventory of a, a high tech environment or a large expanse of merchandise such as going into to do an inventory in the shop right or big malls and all of that which you know if you want, begin to expend energy, physical energy could take you for weeks or months. But deploy a drone. This will simply reduce that man hour to just a few days and you're done with your work. Now, again, you have clients of various sizes, of various capacities, of various uh, capabilities. You also have to determine where and how to begin deploying AIs and what sort of AIs you need to deploy to be able to help your customer uh, ascend to the level of um, productivity they want. Now, I would also like to just uh, put a point uh, to the question that uh, because we didn't have a, uh, a pre-pandemic plan, then the post-pandemic plan we are having is unnecessary. No. The post-pandemic response we have of today becomes the new normal, like 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 we've all all, noticed, all, all said in this in this uh, on this platform. You can't change it because you have moved from one state, state of impact, state of losses, state of casualties, but you have applied some strategies, some techniques to move from that state to a new state, and this new state has taught you a sustainability a free life, free freedom of hassles, and there's no way this state can change. It has become the new normal. So whatever strategies you have brought to bear on post-pandemic on post becomes a new, new, new environment. Now, to sustain that, you now need to tweak a few of the facilities you have brought in, tweak any of the technology, any of the solutions you have brought, into, brought to bear there, and then you find yourself unassailable. And then uh, if there are others, like I said, you can predict, you can predict a disaster. And they can happen anytime. And it can be of any sort. Nobody can say that after 2022, 20, 2023, 20, which we predict, or people predict that this, this uh, kind of disaster, which I call it, will be over. Even some scientists are saying, well, uh, by June, it will fizzle out. But we resurgent again, again in November, and then finally go away in December. There's no empirical evidence to say that. And nobody can prove or say that after 2021 or 2022, that we won't have another pandemic. Nobody can predict that. Or other forms of disaster that could even impact businesses and people beyond what we have seen in COVID. COVID, COVID became sort of uh, an enigma in the sense that we were all locked down. Don't move. Stay where you are. Self detention. So that is the core uh, inhibitor in in COVID nineteen. So when you have been able to conquer that and come to a point where you have now remained safe, you are now moving forward. You don't change it. It becomes your new normal. And then. What then happened is the fact that you now need to find ways to sustain and then make it much more flexible for you to uh, move ahead. So I think uh, that uh, uh, data protection uh, regulation, Ben has uh, said, uh, 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 said something about that. And I think that's much you, you'll be able to know on data protection. The other, other claim like such as the USA, that is what you call HIPAA law, which has some stringent penalties for a breach or even exposure to personal identifying information, which has to do with the public data and all of that. So, but if you go to Nigeria Cyber Security Law uh, 2015, you'll be able to find similar, similar uh, legal provisions that will uh, enable you to understand fully what penalties will, will, be, will be for you if you breach any of those uh, legal codes. And, uh, uh, Finally, if accountants must, must avoid being redundant in this new age, you don't have a choice other than to embrace technology and its disruptions all the way. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Greg, and thank you, everyone. Um, unfortunately, we, are, we will not be able to take uh, more questions. Um, I think um, we will share the slide and also the video recording after this um, webinar. I would like to use this opportunity to thank our panelists, Mr. Olawale, Mr. Ben, and Mr. Greg, uh, Dr. Greg. So uh, please thank you so much on behalf of um, the Institute. And um, thank you so much uh, to all our participants. We have 1,307 participants. And thank you so much, everyone, for your participations. And um, um, I will hand over to, I think I will call it, I think the ICANN uh, webinar series continues um, and expect uh, further communication from ICANN on um, future webinars. Thank you so much, everyone. And Thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. All right, then. Thank you.